Welcome to uh, slide deck 2, which is the second part of the lecture on uric acid metabolism. What we are going to do in this particular lecture is to look at the overview of uric acid homeostasis. Then we will try to define hyperuricemia and gout. We will try to classify gout and understand the biochemical foundations of the different gout types. We will try to define the term pseudogout and look at the various treatment modalities. And at the end of the session, we will encounter some review questions and these review questions we shall focus during our in class session. So that's a simplistic roadmap for these for this deck of slides. Now in case of humans in relatively healthy individual in men the level of uric acid concentration varies between 3 to 7 milligrams per deciliter. And in case of women, it varies between 2 to 5 milligrams per deciliter. Now, I don't need you to memorize these particular levels because if I ask you a question, these levels or the normal physiological levels for men and women will be provided to you in the assessment. The total uric acid pool on an average is somewhere around 1200 milligrams. And if there is no renal impairment, a relatively healthy individual is able to excrete out 500 to 700 milligrams of uric acid per day. In short, in a relatively healthy individual, therefore, the levels of uric acid in the blood are maintained at a level where crystallization of uric acid does not occur. And towards the end of this particular slide deck, we will encounter some data from research where we will see why if the level goes up in an individual, that particular individual experiences gout-like symptoms. Now, if I want to categorize the excretion of uric acid, broadly, two-thirds of the uric acid excretion that takes place in an individual is renal. And uric acid is excreted by the process of glomerular filtration and tubular secretion. So any agent that inhibits or attenuates one of these physiological processes will lead to increase in uric acid concentrations in the blood. One third of uric acid is excreted through the gut where uric acid is broken down into carbon dioxide and ammonia. And this particular biochemical process is known as uricolysis. So recapping the most important part of this slide, two-thirds of uric acid excretion is renal by the process of glomerular filtration and tubular secretion and one-third of uric acid is excreted through the gut where uric acid is converted to carbon dioxide and ammonia 
a biochemical process that's, that is known as uricolysis. Now, what is hyperuricemia and what is gout? Now, hyperuricemia, as the term implies, designates increased serum uric acid levels, which is above 7 milligrams per deciliter in men and above 6 milligrams per deciliter in women. And the causes of hyperuricemia may be excessive alcohol consumption or the presence of cardiometabolic risk factors or presence of inherited metabolic disorders, malignancies and preeclampsia. On the other hand, gout is a metabolic disorder of purine catabolism which results in the overproduction of uric acid. Now, at physiological pH, uric acid is found in a minimal soluble form as monosodium urate crystals, which easily precipitate at lower temperature. And therefore, when a person suffers from gout, the deposition of uric acid crystals or more precisely monosodium urate crystals happens in the lower extremities where the temperature is relatively low. Now if I want to classify gout we can have two classifications. The first one is called the primary gout and under primary gout, we have the inherited cause for gout-like symptoms, which accounts for 90% of the cases that are observed. An inherited form of gout is caused due to inborn error of metabolism, where there is a defect in the enzyme that is associated with the synthesis of purines. Now on the LMS I have uploaded a review article which kind of summarizes the different inborn errors of purine metabolism and tries to identify in which of these inborn errors you observe gout like symptoms. Now you may ask, am I supposed to remember all these inborn errors of metabolism, especially inborn error of purine metabolism? The answer is no. But by analyzing the specific metabolic error, you should be able to predict if gout like symptoms will be observed. For example, let us take one example from this particular paper and that is called the superactivity of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate synthetase which is highlighted here by the red arrow. What happens is that in this particular inborn error, the enzyme becomes superactive, that means it has increased activity, increased catalytic activity and when metabolic tests are done, you have high PRPP levels or high levels of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, which means that there will be higher volumes of purine that will be produced as a result, you will produce higher volumes 
of uric acid and this will lead to gout like symptoms. Therefore, if I block the catabolism of purine, I will be able to attenuate uric acid production and will be able to treat the disorder. And one of the drugs, as you know, that attenuates uric acid production is allopurinol, which is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. Therefore, if a person is suffering from a condition where there is increased activity of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate synthetase, I will be able to treat that particular condition by a xanthine oxidase inhibitor or more precisely I will be able to counter that condition with the help of the drug allopurinol which is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. So by looking at the specific biochemistry I should be able to predict what kind of effect that particular inborn error will pose in a specific individual. So primary gout, 90% of primary gout is inherited whereas the next 10% is idiopathic. Now if I want to define the term idiopathic and I believe you all know what uh, what the term idiopathic designates. Just to recap, idiopathic denotes a diseased condition for which the cause is unknown or not properly defined. And 10% of primary gout is idiopathic. If I want to classify idiopathic primary gout, I can come up with five different probable causes. The first one is a variant form of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate synthetase which is not subject to allosteric control and we will talk about this in a bit of detail. The second type is a variant of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate glutamyl amidotransferase where the enzyme is not sensitive to feedback control and this also leads to gout like symptoms. Then we have the third which is glucose 6-phosphate deficiency. More precisely this particular disorder is known as von Gerg's disease. Here also we observe gout like symptoms and we will try to analyze why in patients suffering from von Gerg's you observe gout like symptoms. Then we will talk about a particular disease state known as Lesch-Nihan syndrome. Very important because this is mostly focused on during assessments and then we will talk about elevation of glutathione reductase and how it also leads to gout like symptoms. So let us first start with the first type which is the variant form of PRPP synthetase. Now from slide deck 1 and from your previous knowledge, you know that PRPP synthetase is an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of ribose 5-phosphate to phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. This particular knowledge you already have. Now, there is a variant form of PRPP synthetase that is not subject to allosteric control. You already know what allosteric control is from your lecture or sessions on enzyme 
inhibition and enzyme regulation. Just to recap, an allosteric site on an enzyme is a site other than the active site which binds regulatory molecules and controls the function or regulates the function of the enzyme. Now PRPP synthetase, the enzyme that is responsible for the conversion of ribose 5-phosphate to phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate is an allosteric enzyme. That means it has an allosteric site which binds regulatory molecules. Now one of the ways of regulating this enzyme is that when I have enough purine nucleotides, these purine nucleotides will regulate or down-regulate, to be more precise, the activity of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate synthetase as a result of which the synthesis of purine nucleotides will go down. So PRPP synthetase, sorry, this particular term needs to be rectified. You need to add the term synthetase here, is under allosteric regulation by purine nucleotides. That means as the level of purine nucleotides rises, PRPP synthetase is inhibited. There is a variant form of PRPP synthetase which is not subject to allosteric inhibition. That means this particular variant of the enzyme is not down-regulated by purine nucleotides, which is shown here in this particular schematic representation. So what happens is, since it is, since the activity of the enzyme is not down-regulated by the rise of purine nucleotides, there is increased synthesis of purine nucleotides which also leads to increased breakdown of purine nucleotides which also leads to the rise in uric acid levels and this therefore once you exceed the normal physiological levels these uric acid molecules form monosodium urate crystals get deposited and the person exhibits gout-like symptoms. Now we go to the second cause that I previously mentioned where we have a variant form of glutamyl PRPP amido transferase. And if I look at the synthetic pathway of purine nucleotides, this particular enzyme is responsible for catalyzing the conversion of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate to 5 phosphoribosyl amine. That means this particular enzyme, to be very precise, increases the formation of purine nucleotides. And therefore, under normal physiological conditions and in a relatively healthy individual, this particular enzyme is under feedback regulation. That means if I have increased purine nucleotides, and you can see this in the figure, that as the levels of purine nucleotides go up, the increased levels inhibit this particular enzyme bringing down the level of purine nucleotide synthesis 
In other words, catabolism of purine nucleotides also goes down, leading to lowering of uric acid levels. However, if this particular enzyme is not subject to feedback control, <coughs> levels of purine nucleotides will increase, catabolism of purine nucleotides will increase, production of uric acid levels will increase, and the person will exhibit gout-like symptoms. So by analyzing the effect of a particular enzyme in the purine metabolic pathways, you should be able to predict why aberrant control of that particular enzyme will lead to gout-like symptoms. Now we move to an interesting aspect where we try to analyze why people with von Gerg's disease exhibit gout. Now, I am pretty sure that this particular disorder was covered in biochemistry by Professor Bayumi in his lecture on inborn errors of metabolism. To recap, in case of patients with von Gerg's disease, there is a deficiency on the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. The enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase is responsible for the conversion of glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. Now, if I do not have the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase, what will happen? I will have higher levels of glucose 6-phosphate. Now, if I have higher levels of glucose 6-phosphate, I can either metabolize it to produce ATP, and if I do not need ATP, then this glucose 6-phosphate will enter the pentose phosphate pathway or the hexose monophosphate shunt pathway, leading to increased production of ribose 5-phosphate. And since I have increased levels of ribose 5-phosphate, I will have increased synthesis of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. And if I have increased levels of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, I will produce increased volumes of purine nucleotides. Since I have increased volume of purine nucleotides, I will also break down these purine nucleotides, leading to increase in the production of uric acid, leading to gout. The other aspect of von Gerg's disease is, the, is that patients with von Gerg's disease suffer from increased concentrations of lactic acid or very precisely lactic acidosis. Now lactic acidosis impairs uric acid excretion. So I am producing more uric acid, I am impairing the excretion of uric acid, levels of uric acid go up and I have gout. That's the very simplistic explanation for this particular disorder 
where you have manifestations of Gao. Now we come to one of the most important diseases associated with catabolism of purine which leads to gout and this particular disorder is known as Leshnihan syndrome. Now this is an X-linked recessive inherited disorder where the person who is affected by the disorder doesn't produce the enzyme HGPRT which is hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase and we talked about this in slide deck 1 and this particular enzyme is involved in the salvage pathway if you remember so if I do not have this particular enzyme I will not be able to salvage purine nucleotides more precisely I will not be able to salvage purine nucleotides from the intermediates hypoxanthine and guanine this will lead to increased degradation of hypoxanthine and guanine which leads to a buildup of uric acid and you can see in the figure this particular individual who is afflict, affected by this disorder exhibits sausage limbs which is a telltale manifestation of gout. Apart from that <coughs> people with Leshnihan also exhibit severe mental re retardation and they self mutilate and you can see it in this particular part of the slide. So Leshnihan syndrome is a particular disorder associated with the deficiency of the enzyme hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase or AGPRT as a result of which people with this particular deficiency are not able to salvage purine nucleotides from the metabolites hypoxanthine and guanine leading to increased production of uric acid which leads to gout like symptoms other than that people with this particular disorder exhibit severe mental retardation and mental disorder more precisely self mutilation so if you have these symptoms <coughs> given to you you should be able to identify this disorder and this is often <coughs> asked in an exam again you may have come across Leshnihan when you are introduced to nucleotide metabolism in the lectures associated with purine metabolism in molecular biology and principles of genetics. Now we come to another <coughs> sorry we come to another aspect which is elevation of glutathione reductase and how elevation of, of this particular enzyme leads to manifestation of gout. Glutathione reductase, this particular enzyme you have been introduced to when you studied pentose phosphate pathway in biochemistry. If I want to recap, this particular enzyme that is glutathione reductase is responsible for converting oxidized glutathione. You can see it here, this is oxidized glutathione to reduce glutathione and in the process of conversion of oxidized glutathione to reduce glutathione this particular enzyme requires NADPH which is generated in the pentose phosphate pathway. Now 
in certain states, disease states, there is abnormal activity of glutathione reductase. That means the enzyme becomes more active or it becomes super active. If the enzyme becomes more active, what will happen is <coughs> it will produce more reduced glutathione. In the process, it will deplete the pools of NADPH. As a result, the pentose phosphate pathway or the hexose monophosphate shunt pathway will be facilitated and you will have increased production of ribose 5-phosphate. As ribose 5-phosphate goes up, you have more phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate and as phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate goes up, you have <coughs> increased synthesis of purine nucleotides. The volume of purine nucleotides go up, therefore they will be cat uh, catabolized more and the volume of uric acid produ production will also go up and this will lead to gout. So that's the logical sequence of the biochemistry involved for gout in people who have abnormal activity of glutathione reductase. And since this particular enzyme is increased in response to oxidative stress, people suffering from or people having an aberrant form of the enzyme when exposed to certain triggers have more prominent gout-like symptoms. Now we finished with primary gout and the one that is of clinical relevance is the secondary gout. Now if I want to describe secondary gout, secondary gout takes place in different disease tests where there is increased synthesis of uric acid or decreased excretion of uric acid. So the first aspect is overproduction of uric acid which leads to gout like symptoms. Now in which of the disease states one will observe increased production of uric acid. The first disease state is psoriasis and I am pretty sure you know what psoriasis is. It is an autoimmune disorder which affects the skin and these people produce a lot of uric acid or psoriasis is associated with hyperuricemia and therefore when a person suffering from psoriasis is exposed to specific triggers there is increased production of uric acid which leads to gout. Why in psoriasis there is increased production of uric acid? The biochemical mechanism underlying this observation is still not properly described or it is still not known to be very precise. The second aspect where you will observe overproduction of uric acid is 
in diseased conditions which is uh, diseased conditions which are associated with malignancy or cancer in malignancy since there is overproduction of nucleic acids because of the rapidly dividing cancer cells there is also an increased catabolism of nucleotides and this leads to overproduction of uric acid and this leads to manifestation of gout also after treatment of large tumor masses by radiotherapy chemotherapy trauma there is increased breakdown of nucleic acids which leads to increased catabolism of purines higher levels of uric acid production and then to gout the second aspect under secondary gout is reduced excretion of uric acid and logically one can identify conditions where there is reduced excretion of uric acid two-third of uric acid is excreted by the kidney so if there is renal impairment for example in chronic renal failure there is less excretion of uric acid and this uric acid then builds up and the person exhibits gout like symptoms <clears throat> increased alcohol consumption leads to lactic acidosis and when we talked about von Gerg's I mentioned that lactic acid impairs uric acid excretion since increased consumption of alcohol leads to lactic acidosis there is less excretion of uric acid more precisely less tubular excretion of uric acid which leads to gout like symptoms a study was done a very interesting study I thought of highlighting it here where they looked at different alcohol beverages and how these alcohol beverages affect the level of uric acid in the serum and you can see here what they did they took wine beer and liquor and when we talk about liquor it consists of it it is a category which under which you can take drinks like rum whiskey etc and you can see that beer is responsible for increasing the levels of uric acid much more prominently than the other alcoholic beverages whereas wine on the other hand decreases the levels of uric acid in the serum compared to other alcoholic beverages very interesting uh, study but if you look at it here look at this particular aspect this particular aspect also correlated with the BMI's however to cut the long story short people with renal impairment should be careful about consumption of alcohol because on one side they are not able to excrete uric acid through the kidney on the other hand lactic acidosis which is caused by consumption of alcohol impairs the excretion of uric acid and both these conditions then couple leading to significant increase in uric acid levels and this leads to gout like symptoms like lactic acidosis 
ketoacidosis also impairs tubular excretion of uric acid and ketoacidosis is a very very common observation in patients with type 2 diabetes therefore people suffering from type 2 diabetes are often at a higher risk of suffering from gout one aspect i would like to highlight here are the thiazide diuretics which are used for the treatment of hypertension these drugs also impair the tubular secretion of uric acid therefore hypertensive individuals also have a higher risk of suffering from gout of course you have to take this <clears throat> with a 360 degree view because hypertensive individuals also have other comorbid conditions like type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome so there is lactic acidosis there is ketoacidosis so when we add all this to the equation the risk of people suffering from gout also exponentially increases So what are the clinical features of gout? We talked about primary and secondary gout. But what are the clinical features? Because of the low solubility of uric acid, and as I told you previously in slide deck one, we are not able to convert uric acid to allantoin. So uric acid deposits in various parts of the body and most of the time you see that there is deposition in the first metatarsophalangeal joint or the great toe and that is because comparatively in this region of the body the temperature is relatively lower than the core body temperature as a result of which there is facilit uh, facilitation of crystallization of uric acid or more precisely monosodium urate crystals and these deposits of crystals are known as trophy and these lead to inflammation of the joint which is a telltale feature of gout. One aspect that I would like to mention is that postmenopausal women are at an increased risk of suffering from gout because of the fact that estrogen has urocosoric, urocosoric effect that means it helps in the excretion of uric acid so prior to menopause the risk of gout in women is relatively very low because one if you remember the first first aspect of the slides that we talked about we mentioned the levels of uric acid in women is generally lower compared to men and because of the uricosoric effect of estrogen the risk of let us say premenopausal women suffering from gout is relatively very low however after menopause levels of estrogen go down therefore there is a build up of build up of uric acid and also you need to understand that as a person grows older there are other comorbid conditions that also develop and these are type 2 diabetes hypertension which add to the equation leading to increase in the titers of uric acid and therefore this may lead to increased risk of gout also males are at a higher risk of gout than females if gout is not controlled or treated properly with time these monosodium urate crystals they deposit inside the kidney 
and that leads to the formation of renal calculi or stone and this is kind of a figure that shows you how what may happen if levels of uric acid increase and are not controlled in individuals who are at a higher risk of suffering from gout. Now I wanted to mention some of the research that I came across. I like this because it helps you to get a more 360 degree view of the of the biochemistry underlying gout. If you look at the levels of uric acid or serum urate, you will see that males have a higher uric acid levels, uh, higher uh, serum urate levels compared to females, which is shown here in this particular slide. And therefore, since urate crystallizes higher than 6 point, uh, at uh, levels higher than 6.8 milligrams per deciliter, males who have higher concentration of uric acid or in other words who have higher serum urate levels are at a higher risk of suffering from gout and that's the thing that I mentioned in the previous slide. So that's that's the reason you can see here levels are higher in males compared to females. Also females especially post uh, premenopausal females are at a lower risk because of the higher levels of estrogen. Then with higher age groups, there is increased levels of um, hyperuricemia. So if you can, if you look, look here, these are the levels of, so these are the different years and prevalence per 100 and uh, 1000 participant in this particular study that was conducted by Wallace. And you can see here that as age increases, the levels of hyperurea or the levels of serum urate goes up. And this is 75 plus. And you can see here what they did is they monitored the levels of serum urates across different age groups in uh, over a period of 10 years. And of the 1,000 enrollees um, per year, sorry, um, the prevalence of hyperuricemia per 1,000 enrollees, when they converted it, they found out that higher age groups have high level of serum uric acid. And the reason for that is very simple. As age increases, there is impairment of renal function, which means there is impairment of uric acid excretion. One thing that I wanted to highlight, and sometimes a clinician will try to manage gout by controlling the diet. There are several um, foods, common foods that you encounter which have very high level of purine content. So if a person has a higher risk of suffering from gout or is suffering from gout, these particular foods should be taken in restricted amounts. And you can see here in the list, we have salmon, which is one of the prescribed food for omega-3 uh, uh, omega fatty acids often prescribed to people with cardiovascular disease. Similarly, one should restrict the intake of red meat. Beer, of course, I showed that in a study that they did significantly increases the levels of uric acid. Same goes for brewer's yeast, which is present in several of the alcoholic beverages, sardines, mussels and clams. These should be taken in restricted amounts if a person is uh, suffering from gout or has a predisposition of high hyperuricemia. Coming back to our 
discussion on drugs when I was mentioning I talked about diuretics which should be taken which should be restricted for people who have hyperuricemia similarly low dose aspirin and drugs like niacin of course niacin nowadays is not prescribed anymore <coughs> for treatment of um, for elevating um, the levels of HDL but this drug should also be restricted or managed properly let us say this way in people who have a predisposition towards suffering from gout or hyperuricemia so how do we treat gout the common drug that you will encounter over and over again is allopurinol which is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor and allopurinol is a suicide inhibitor by now you should be able to identify what a suicide inhibitor is we talked about this in our sessions on enzyme inhibition i will request you to go to your textbook of biochemistry and read the section of gout in that particular in that chapter and because this particular diagram actually is borrowed from from your textbook only so before we end let us talk about a condition known as pseudo gout what is pseudo gout that is not true gout here serum uric acid levels are normal but the symptoms that are observed in people suffering from pseudo gout is similar to gout and that is because of the deposition of calcium pyrophosphate crystals not monosodium urate crystals in the joint now we come to the review questions i will not go through the review questions in the recorded part of the slides because these are for discussion in the class so when we are talking about when we are in the class we will talk about or discuss these particular questions which will help you to understand the biochemical bio, the biochemistry underlying the pathophysiology of gout now what i do uh, what i started doing from this year and i did it for your juniors is that i want you to create one or two mcq based on what you have learned from these slide decks and also based on the type of review questions that you encountered at the end of the session because if you formulate questions yourself i believe it helps you to understand a given topic better while preparing this material i referred to couple of textbooks my personal favorite harper's biochemistry i also referred to the textbook of biochemistry by pankaj nair if you are having access to this textbook i will uh, encourage you to look at it because this particular textbook focuses more on the clinical correlations and therefore may be helpful for you if you are preparing for some of the licensing exams i also uh, looked at some of the journal articles because part of what i delivered is also uh, associated with my research so some of the interesting facts i wanted to show to you so i have referred to the journal articles the references of course is of course is indicated in the slide so if you want to go back have a read through these articles you are free to do so but one of the important articles that summarizes the important inborn errors associated with purine metabolism i have uploaded it on the lms because that particular article is pretty comprehensive in providing a list of all the inborn errors associated with purine metabolism and i believe you can keep that as a reference and also i have borrowed some slide sets from the american medical association and these are indicated with a blue background you can go to the different cpd events that are conducted by ama and you can look at these slides because i believe this will also help you to understand the topic better with that i end the uh, lecture here and see you in the class and have a nice day